everyone and welcome to this week's Wildlife Wednesday Weekly Roundup. I'm your host, Tenley Thompson, and we've got a bunch of really exciting wildlife videos and sightings to show you this week. The way this is going to work is I'm going to show you all the latest and greatest that's been going on in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem this week. And then you'll get a chance to, enter, to answer a trivia question uh, towards some money towards our online gift store. Last but not least, I'll be answering all your questions live at the end of this broadcast. So if you've got any natural history or wildlife biology or Yellowstone or Grand Teton oriented questions, you can start asking them there in the comments section and I'll see if I can't get you some answers. Let's go ahead and get started with the latest in wildlife sightings. My favorite view this week was of grizzly bear 610. Let's check in with her. Quite a few of our wildlife trips this week got a chance to hang out with Grizzly Bear 610 and her two uh, two-year-old cubs. So for those of you guys who um, watch every week, you're going to know that Grizzly Bear 610 is the daughter of 399. For those of you guys who might be new this week, Grizzly Bear 399 is sort of our matriarch of the Teton range. She's sort of the oldest female. She had this bear that we're looking at here, Grizzly Bear 610, about 12 years ago. 610 has two cubs that she uh, that were born last year and she's continuing to raise this year. And she was out and about quite a bit this week with those two cubs. You can kind of see them peeking up above the grass. Laura got this great footage of them in and amongst the wildflowers. I also got a couple uh, good views of her out in and about in those flowers this week. Uh, she's getting to be um, a little bit lighter colored than she was when she was younger, uh, but you can see that her cubs are actually really quite a bit lighter colored. And what's interesting to me, uh, this is one of the cubs here, is how uh, old they're getting. They're starting to look like full adult bears these days. So it really was fun to see these guys mosey across this gravel road here in Grand Teton National Park and make their way down to the river bottoms to look for more uh, roots and bulbs and great uh, vegetation that's, you know, starchy bulbs, full of carbohydrates, really good eating. So some great footage this week from Laura. Thanks very much of that for uh, getting this great shot of Grizzly Bear 610 and those cute little cubs there, not so little anymore. Laura also got kind of an interesting view uh, in Yellowstone National Park of a grizzly bear uh, scratching itself and scent marking on a tree. This is something that you don't get to see very often. Definitely an itchy fellow, probably also leaving scent using his oil glands to let other bears know that he's been in the area. So kind of a neat thing to be able to see out in the field. It was kind of an overcast day, so a little hard to see, but you can see he definitely was very itchy scratching himself on that tree. So thanks very much for all of that fantastic footage. Hope you've enjoyed some of our views of bears this week. So while I particularly enjoyed the time I spent with Grizzly Bear 610 this week, I found Laura's video of that bear scent marking on that tree particularly interesting. If you head all over the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, you can actually see some great areas where bears have actually clawed and marked trees to let other bears know about their territories. Always something to keep in mind when you're out in the field. And if you come on a trip with us, ask a guide to show you some. We all have our favorite marked trees. I'm sure we'd be glad to show you. Our guy Josh got some pretty funny video this week of a wolf doing something that I think a lot of dog owners are going to find pretty familiar. Josh this week got a very funny view of the alpha female of the Junction Butte Pack. Here she is rolling in something most probably that doesn't smell very good. I bet dog owners will commiserate on that one. A lot of people do like to comment that she does look a little bit skinny for a wolf. Do remember that summertime is the hardest time of year for wolves. Uh, winter is their time of plenty. It's a great time to be an elk, uh, but not such a good time to be a wolf in the summertime. By the way, did you guys see that great blue heron photobombing in the distance? So thanks, Josh, for that footage. So I definitely would not have wanted to smell that wolf after she was done rolling in all of that. 
And I hope you all saw that great blue heron because that really made me laugh when Josh sent me the video this week that it's just hanging out like, oh, no big deal. There's a wolf right there. Now there's more to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem than just its wildlife. We've got a whole lot more going on. But first and foremost, I'd love to let everybody, I'd love to ask everybody where you're joining us from. Please comment in the comment section, tell me. I'd love to see how far these videos are traveling and it's a big rush for me to see where everybody's visiting from. Hi to all of our return watchers. Don, it's good to see you again. Thank you for joining us. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about your adventures in Jackson Hole. Have you been to visit the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem? Tell us about your trip. Give some good recommendations for folks who might be planning to visit. This video typically gets shared and spread to people who might be planning on visiting the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So if you've got some good advice for them, do let them know. And lastly, tell us a little bit about what you'd like to see in our broadcast series. Is there a specific animal you'd like us to go find for you? We do take special requests and so let us know. We have a ton going on in the natural world, but we also have a ton going on in the summer sky. I've worked in astronomy programs and as an astronomer for many, many years, although my background is as a wildlife biologist, I have never had quite so much going on all at once in the summer sky. Let's check in and see some of it. It's been a really good week for night sky and star watching this week. We're very lucky here in the Tetons to get a wonderful alpine glow condition uh, in the mountains right at sunset where everything glows a beautiful blue if you've never come out to see us in the summertime. And of course, we're known here as a location where night skies are spectacular because we have very few surface lights. And so our night sky um, is always really fantastic. If you've never really had a chance to see the full magnitude of the night sky uh, at night, definitely come see us here in Jackson Hole. More exciting, we currently have a comet in view over the Northern Hemisphere of the planet. This comet's called Neo Wise. It's named after the Near Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, which spells Neo Wise. It's a NASA project that found this original comet on March 27th, and 2020 of this year. If you wanna see it before it's gone, it's gonna be in view all of late July, but it's particularly good right now because there is no moon in view. So I went out last night and got some of these views that we're seeing. If you can find a spot away from city lights, you're gonna look just below the Big Dipper in the Northwest sky. And if you have them, bring binoculars or a spotting scope because it is absolutely fantastic with just a little bit of magnification. Also in view in the evening sky right now is fantastic views of Jupiter. And Ecotour's guide, Maddie, got this fantastic view of a time lapse of Jupiter and its Galilean moons. I also got a chance to catch uh, Jupiter last night and I got three out of the four moons in view. So definitely make sure you're looking up outside. Lots going on in this summer sky and it's an exciting time to be out and star watching. So again, if you'd like to see Comet Neowise, it's going to be probably in view, hard to say, but they think, astronomers, for the entire last half of July. What you want to do is in the evenings, although it is viewable at dawn as well, but it's easier for most folks in the evenings, look just a little bit past dusk into the northwest sky. If you're in the Teton range, you probably want to get a little bit of height so you can see above the mountains. I'm hoping as this comet gets higher and higher in the night sky, I'll get you some more pictures and videos with it directly behind the Tetons. Wouldn't that be something? But what you're going to do is find the Big Dipper, which hopefully everybody can find the Big Dipper. Look directly below the Big Dipper. You can't miss it. It's got a three mile long tail. The other big highlight last week, last night, that while I was taking all those photos, I had the most bright object go right over the top of me, and it was the International Space Station, which is something I've never had the chance to catch before, something you're interested in doing for yourself. Any kind of one of those stargazing phone apps can tell you when it's going to be overhead. All right, let's go another direction. Yellowstone National Park is something that we all spend much of our weeks visiting. And there's so much more to our lower loop trips than just going to Old Faithful and seeing the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone and the Lower Falls, which are spectacular once in a lifetime opportunities. But there's more to Yellowstone than that. So let's check in on some of the great things the guides have been seeing there this week. 
It was a busy week in Yellowstone with lots and lots of trips up there, but I think Laura wins the Yellowstone sighting of the week with this unbelievable bison jam, bison traffic jam that she and her guests got themselves in the middle of. They're on top of the vehicle out through the hatches checking this out uh, from a nice safe distance as the bison are crossing the river in the Hayden Valley and coming down uh, to the cool wallows. Let's check in with Laura as she explains to her guests why some of these males are rolling so vigorously in the dirt as they see them come by. Like, hey ladies, um, yeah, I'm huge. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big bison and yeah, I can get down on the ground, roll in the dust. And the best part is I'm so vigorous that I can get back up again. <laughs> Like, what a cool circus trick is that? Yeah. See, I'd be a great bison. I'd get all the ladies. I'd get the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Seth and his guests got this great view of the brink of the upper falls of the Yellowstone River flowing down over the edge into a beautiful rainbow. How pretty is that view? Surely a highlight for that group. Uh, this week. We also got some other great footage of thermal features. Kelsey got this great view from up high of Grand Prismatic, as well as Morning Glory Pool, a big guest favorite in the park. And Seth got a great view of Excelsior Geyser Crater. Excelsior Geyser was the largest geyser in Yellowstone National Park until it exploded in the 1880s, leaving this deep blue, beautiful pool. We also got some views of Sunset Pool this week in the clouds. And of course, it's not a trip of Yellow to Yellowstone without a great view of Old Faithful going off from a nice, safe social distance up on Geyser Hill flowing into the clouds. So thanks this very much this week from Kelsey, Seth, and Laura. I loved the steam of Old Faithful moving into the clouds there. Such a pretty view. So big thanks to all of our guides from Yellowstone this week. Now, if you're enjoying this broadcast, please consider liking and sharing our video so that other folks will have the chance to see it too. The ability for this broadcast to become bigger every week and expand its reach is what allows us to continue doing it. So if you're having a good time, I know everybody always asks for that on videos, but it would mean a lot to us if you'd certainly consider it. We spend a lot of time on our Wildlife Wednesday broadcasts, and it's probably my fault talking about the big charismatic megafauna, as they call them in wildlife biology. The big exciting things, wolves, grizzlies, bison, elk, moose, but there's so much more to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So this week, I wanted to spend some time focusing in on some of the smaller mammals that live here too. So it was a fun week for the smaller mammals of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Let's start with this great view of a beaver family shot by our naturalist, Laura, who showed you those wolves earlier. We've got a pretty large full adult beaver on the bank here. And then we've got another large beaver, maybe it's mate, bringing in trees to help build up their lodge and dam. And then a sub-adult beaver, not this year's baby, which is known as a kit, but likely last year's baby uh, coming into view, coming onto the shore with that full adult. So the way beavers work is they keep two generations of the family at a time safe in that den. And that last year's group of kits, that last year's group of babies, uh, they are going to help the parents raise this year's group of babies who are probably nice and safe in their lodge there while everyone else forages and brings them trees back to eat. They eat the cambrium, the inner bark of trees. Sean got a view of another beaver family and this particular individual beaver is hauling in entire aspen tree across the oxbow bend of the Snake River. If you look at how thick and big this tree is, as this fellow drags it across the river. This is really an impressive feat and uh, pretty fun for Seth and his guests to watch. Another aquatic mammal commonly mistaken for a beaver is the muskrat. 
And you can see with this little rat tail that this fellow has, he's definitely not a beaver, although people oftentimes do uh, get the two of them mixed up when out, in and, out and about in the parks. And lastly, on the aquatic side of things, we also saw some river otters this week frolicking about uh, on the Snake River. And these guys were having a good time out there in the light rain. Kelsey got this very rare view of a pine marten just for a couple seconds outside Old Faithful. And then Seth got a really interesting view uh, of a coyote in a hot springs area over in West Thumb in Yellowstone, which is pretty unusual as well. So that was really neat to see. We also had a brief view of a skunk from the car. We don't see a lot of skunks here. We have both striped and spotted skunks in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, so that was fun. And then last but not least, Sean had a great look at a snowshoe hair in its summer coloration. So you can see this fellow is quite brown, but he's still got the white feet of that classic snowshoe hair. So a big thanks to Laura, Seth, and Sean for those great, all of those great videos of the small mammals of the Great Yellowstone ecosystem. Fun fact, did you know we have more types of weasels and rodents than anywhere else in the world here? And keep in mind, something like a beaver certainly counts as a rodent. So before you judge, there's some pretty cool rodents out there too. All right, I know what you really want are the big animals. So let's take a look first at some elk. Kelsey got a brief view of some bull elk in Grand Teton National Park, including a very early season bugle from one of these guys uh, up in the high areas of um, the mountains where they're sitting way above the valley floor. In the meantime, she also got a view this week of some of the cow and calf elk, and they stay pretty separate away from those bulls. Those bulls feel like those elk calves are probably the most vulnerable members of the population. They don't want to be vulnerable as well, so they avoid the cow, elk, and the calves, as bad as that sounds, in the summertime. Um, Mike also got some great views on the valley floor of some female elk and their calves as well, sort of hanging out in that lupine. What was most fascinating to me about this herd is that you can see some of the calves from last year, what we call spike bulls, those little spiky pieces of velvet still in the herd. Uh, this fall, the large bulls will probably drive those younger bulls away from those cows and they'll be in bachelor herds after that. Let's check in with Seth to learn more about bachelor herds. So we are in Yellowstone right now, the north rim of the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. We're looking at a small bachelor herd here. All season long. These big bulls will hang out with each other and they're best friends, but then come fall, their testosterone levels increase by a thousand percent and they literally want to kill each other and they'll, they'll end up fighting each other and they're fighting for breeding rights to the cow-calf herds or the harem herds. And right now you'll notice there's still velvet on their antlers. That means they're still growing. Uh, that velvet is kind of porous and it's allowing oxygen to the bone as it grows. Right now the bone's really soft still, so they have to be careful maneuvering through the woods, making sure they don't bump those antlers or anything, because then it could grow um, in a strange direction, and females prefer um, symmetry in antlers. So they want to protect those antlers while they're growing. Once the bone calcifies or hardens um, in the fall, that velvet sheds off and they uh, will rub the velvet off on trees. It's kind of similar to a scab almost. And they'll clean off all that velvet, look nice and pretty for the females, while at the same time sharpening those tines to batter, battle other bulls uh, for the mating rates. So there you go. So we have some of the best and biggest bull elk here in the world. We also have the greatest density of elk in Jackson Hole in the world. No matter what season you come to join us, it's a good time to see elk. 
but it's particularly fun to see them when they're growing out those velvet antlers. So I've been seeing in the comment section, lots of people talking about how these great, these videos would be great for kids. If you're watching with kids and they have a question for me, please do ask it in the comment section. At the end of the video, I will definitely be answering your questions live. So if you've got a question, whether you're an adult or your kid, I'm happy to answer, see if you can stump me. But in the meantime, let's take a look at some bison and moose. Laura got a fun view this week of some bison jumping over some of the fences in Grand Teton National Park. And you can see this old bull had a pretty easy time of it. Bison can e easily clear even a seven foot fence. This other bull, when he came up, he needed a little bit more um, convincing of himself, had to sit there and think about it a little bit before he made the big jump to get into greener pastures, so to speak, which was fun to watch just simply because of the sort of reluctance, oh, I guess I'll jump over the fence. We also got some great views of nursing calves with their mothers today. Notice the C-shaped horns in comparison that tells us this is a female and this little red dog, which is what we call a baby bison, uh, is nursing pretty effectively. You can see these red dogs are starting to darken in color. A lot of predators are colorblind on the red-green spectrum. And so when they're orange, when they're born like that, they blend into the grass. But as they get older and that becomes less necessary, they start to darken into that adult dark brown coloration. Lastly, you didn't think I'd forget our moose, did ya? You can see by the white rear end on this moose that this is a female, a cow moose. Also the lack of antlers found by Seth here. We also had a great view of a bull moose this week with Kelsey right at sunset just outside Grand Teton National Park. You can see how quickly those antlers are growing. He's gonna grow up to 40 pounds of antler by the fall rut season. So really neat to see there. So I've got lots more moose footage for everybody for next week. I got a bunch of it this morning from the guides, just a little too late to include to tonight's broadcast. But oh my gosh, is there moose activity going on in Grand Teton National Park particularly. So more on all those moose for you next week. But we've got a pretty funny video from you. Uh, for many, many years, we promise not to talk about locations in these videos because it's important to respect wildlife space and give them the ethical room to, uh, to move around. And if I spend a bunch of time on the internet telling everybody exactly where something lives, it's a problem. But for many, many years, this one's okay. Uh, Signal Mountain has had some really um, broody grouse at the top of the mountain. And I'm going to give away that for many years, there's been these very human habituated uh, grouse that live up there. Seth got a very funny video of one this week. So let's check it out. All right. So we're on top of Signal Mountain. And we're having a stare off with a grouse here. See if you can spot him. So he's not too concerned with us. We're going to kind of just walk by him. Hey, buddy. Yep, he's just kind of doing his own thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll leave him be. We'll keep on walking so we don't stress him out. So that made me laugh. I th hopefully it made you guys laugh, too. I always love to see those grouse when we go up there. If you get a chance to visit Signal Mountain, do give the grouse their space. You definitely want to give them plenty of room, even if sometimes they don't want to give you plenty of room uh, as the, uh, the human and the adult in the room, so to speak, <laughs> try and give them their space. But it can be a little tough up there. Those grouse can come right up to you strutting around. It's pretty funny to watch. All right, I don't want to be remiss if we miss the largest population of animals in the world, and that's insects. For this next segment, there's a whole bunch of people on the eastern part of this country who are going to know exactly what this is, but it's a little bit of a different version. Let's tune in with Josh and find out more. Hello everyone, Josh Matten with Jackson Lake Couture Adventures here. 
Um, today I want to talk to you about a video I got earlier this week. Um, some mountain cicadas are out and making quite a lot of noise right now. Uh, mountain cicadas are a different species from the periodic cicada, which is emerging right now in a 17 year emergence in the East Coast, um, but still a pretty spectacular animal. They live underground for around two to five years before emerging and will only be alive for a few weeks. Um, they, the males buzz using uh, specialized structures along their abdomen to attract females. Um, they don't eat very much, they don't bite or sting, and their primary focus right now, in addition to making all that ruckus, is to find mates. Um, very important food source for a lot of birds, uh, small mammals, even coyotes or foxes will feed on these animals, and it's been quite a big year. We've seen, seen a lot of cicadas out there. So if you're going out and about in the woods um, around the greater Yellowstone ecosystem or even close to your home and you hear a bunch of buzzing, look for these um, really cool looking bugs, cicadas. So for those of you out east, particularly the southeast, who are pretty tired of those 17 year cicadas, I hear you, although I'm a little sad to miss them. It's always kind of neat when they come out. It's such an amazing emergence natural world event. These guys are a little different. They aren't gonna come out every 17 years. Thanks very much to Josh for looking into that because I actually didn't know all that much about our local cicadas. So I learned a lot this week from that particular segment. I do wanna let you guys know about a blog post that we've got up on our website all about our fish and fishing in the ecosystem. Uh, we've got just this great uh, look at all of the different uh, areas of fish, the different kind of fish that we have with our fishing expert and naturalist and biologist, Kirk. So make sure you check that out. I'm sure we'll have a link up for you in the comment section shortly, uh, but I did wanna let you guys know that that was going on. Okay, so those are the videos we have for the week. We've got our trivia question coming up next. And then after that, we've got all sorts of good questions I see coming in in the comment section for me to answer. So if you've got a question, now's your chance to ask. But let's go ahead and start first and foremost with last week's trivia question. Now, for those of you guys who don't know how this works, uh, we started an online store during our closure during the, the first bad wave of the COVID epidemic pandemic, epidemic, pandemic. Uh, we used that to pay for health, health insurance for our employees. So, um, and we were using it to pay 100% of the health insurance while we were closed. We continue to use that to pay for their health insurance now. So if that's of interest to you, uh, if you answer our trivia question correctly, you'll get a $10 gift card to our store, but do go check out our store anyway. I wanted to profile um, my favorite item of the week, which are these really cool bighorn sheep skull shirts for men and women that were hand drawn by our guide, Laura. So if you wanna get one of these cool shirts, uh, you'll be $10 closer in by answering our question this week. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna answer last week's question first, and then we'll give you a chance at that gift card uh, with this week's question. So first I'm gonna answer, first I'm gonna show you last week's question. Feel free to answer in the comment section if you want to, just to prove you know the answer, but we've already chosen a winner from last week. Then I'm gonna ask you this week's question and then you definitely wanna comment in the comment section for your chance to win. So first and foremost, the question from last week is what is the name of this animal? Hey buddy. Hey there. If you think you know the answer, go ahead and comment in the comment section. This is last week's question, so it won't count for the uh, gift card to the store, but you can go ahead and guess anyway. 
For those of you guys who've already guessed, or you're guessing in your head, the answer is those are river otters. That video was taken by our biologist Verlin, who found them in Grand Teton National Park. That's a family of river otters. They're one of the larger members of our weasel family. So Rosemary, you were right, they are a weasel. Uh, but their specific type of weasel, river otter, was the answer we were looking for. So if you joined us last week and you guessed correctly, hopefully we'll be in touch shortly and you can see if you won a gift card. Okay, this one, this one's for the money. What I need from you guys this week is I'm going to show you a picture and I'm going to tell you already, it's a bear. What I need from you is to tell me what kind of bear it is. Now, for those of you guys who joined us last week where I talked about how the difference to tell the difference between black bears and grizzlies, this will be easy for you. But a quick tutorial for those of you guys who weren't with us last week, we're looking for um, grizzlies have big round faces and they have um, very, they're almost hidden ears in their fur. Black bears are going to have uh, sort of uh, long sort of Roman noses. They don't come out. They kind of sit sort of flat and they're going to have very visible ears. You never want to use size or color to differentiate between the two species. I'm going to go ahead and give you a hint. It's not a polar bear. Uh, it's either going to be a black bear or grizzly. Okay, so to win a chance for $10 at our gift store, all you have to do in the comment section is comment which type of bear is this. Everybody ready? Go ahead and make a guess. You want to be looking at the ears, you want to be looking at the nose, but you never want to use size or color. So go ahead and get a good look at that. See if you can't comment in the comment section and uh, hopefully one of you guys will win that gift card. Okay. So that's our trivia question this week. Those are the videos we have for the week. So now I'm going to answer your questions live. Now bear with me, I've got my iPad here and I'm going to have to look down to see the comments. So if you're wondering what on earth is going on, if you've just joined us, I'm going to scroll through real quick and we'll see if we can't get you guys some answers. Sound good? Okay. Let's see. Toya's asking, does the alpha female have no pups this year? Is it common for her to be solo wandering the park? Toya, that is the alpha female of the Junction Butte Pack. You're right. Uh, but this time of year, yes, her pups are old enough that they can be left with babysitters at a rendezvous site. Uh, and she can go hunting solo or in a small group while the rest of the pack uh, takes care of the pups. You know, it really takes a village to raise wolves. Every member of the pack is involved. It's not just the alpha female. Those pups, of course are uh, still dependent on her for nursing, but they're beginning to eat solid food as well. And she can go ahead and take the occasional wander to go roll in stinky stuff like we saw in that video. So hopefully that answers for you. Let's see what else we got here. People commenting on the moons of Jupiter. If you go out on a trip with us, just ask the guy to show you the moons of jo Jupiter in the spotting scope if you're out uh, in the evening after Jupiter's come up and you can get exactly the same view. Wow, Kim, that was quite the sighting you had in Yellowstone of a grizzly. That's very cool. Libby saw the space station last night. That's awesome. Way to go, Libby. Air high five. Dawn asks, are there mountain lions in the area behind the elk refuge or bighorn sheep? So Dawn, remember my policy, I'm definitely not going to give exact locations of wildlife just to protect uh, them from over visitation. The reason I have that policy is because of mountain, mountain lions uh, historically that have been on the National Elk Refuge who've been overwhelmed by visitors, really stressed out. Uh, early on in my career, there was a mother with kittens that we were able to watch for several weeks and then word got out and it just got crazy uh, and it was very hard on her. The short answer to your question is we have a very, very stable population of mountain lions in the Grovant Range. That is behind the elk refuge, so to speak. Summertime is not sort of the time when we're most likely to see them. Just like wolves, winter is your time of plenty when you're a mountain lion. It's when everything else is struggling, you're doing really well. Everything's doing really well right now, so it's a more lean time for mountain lions, same as it is for wolves. 
but our mountain lion population is doing well there, and it might be something we might get a view of perhaps this winter. As for bighorn sheep, sort of the same issue. Those bighorn sheep that you see on the National Elk Refuge in the fall, winter, and spring on Miller Butte uh, actually migrate in the summertime high up into the Grovants, uh, and their population is quite stable. They're doing really well. The population's actually growing, and I have seen some bighorn sheep relatively recently in the Grovants, but I haven't done a big drive back there to get way kind of up where you could see them, and I haven't been on a big hike uh, in the last couple weeks. But if I had been, I'm quite sure, with a little bit of searching with binoculars, sure, you absolutely can see them back there right now. It's a great spot to see them. Ah, Lee, that's my Aunt Lee. Lee Bowen asks, bear 610 and 399 are tagged bears. When do you tag the cubs or adolescents? What is the reason for tagging? Lee, that is a very good question. Thanks for asking that and thanks for joining us in. Hi, Aunt Lee. Um, so let me start by explaining that 399 and 610 are their research numbers. That's not their ear numbers. Common misconception. Bears are gonna be tagged for a couple different reasons. They're typically tagged as part of the interagency grizzly bear study team. Grizzly bears are currently listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act, meaning they're monitored and protected by the federal government. We can't recover the species or get the species up to a certain population with the hope of eventually taking them off the endangered species list if we don't know how many of them there are. So putting ear tags on the bears helps us with our population and our census counts. It helps us understand how many bears there are, as well as using hair traps and DNA samples. Um, and rub traps out in the woods. That's a good way too. It's actually really hard to count grizzly bears. One of the more important things we wanna know is how many breeding age females are in a particular area because while the males are great, at the end of the day, the future of the species in terms of population depends greatly on those breeding age females and how many of their cubs are surviving past the age of five. That three to five year old range for cubs is very difficult. So we collar and ear tag bears so that we can census and study them, but we also collar and ear tag bears that have strong human habituation and strong roadside behavior. I say we, I don't have anything to do with it. The interagency grizzly bear study team decides that. But basically 399 has a history of being near roadsides. She has a history of interaction with people. When she was quite young, she got into the garbage behind Jackson Lake Lodge. And that's when she originally received her ear tag and her research number um, as a bear who had gotten into trouble with people. All of her offspring have been raised in front of people, meaning they're also very human habituated, meaning the odds of them getting into conflict with people, whether that be eating bird feeders or being hit by cars or, you know, all sorts of things uh, are higher, but the odds of them having cubs and raising them on the roadsides like 610 her daughter does are higher. Um, I certainly don't know all of the policies behind the decision making. I do know through quite a few reputable sources that it is considered good policy to consistently give research tags to all of the offspring of 399 just because the odds of them getting themselves into conflict are a little bit higher. Many of them are wearing red ear tags in the park. It's not uncommon in the first year that those cubs are on their own away from their mother that they will receive those ear tags. So for instance, 399's last set of cubs, she's got uh, two cubs that are still out in Grand Teton National Park. They would probably receive those ear tags this year. Blondie has two cubs that are out in the park that have not received tags yet, but everybody anticipates by the end of the year, they'll probably have tags as well. That's just to keep an eye on them. If they survive till they're about five or six years old and they stay out of trouble uh, and those tags fall out or the radio colors they're wearing fall off, there may be made a decision not to put new tags on. Um, at that point, the odds of them surviving in the long term are much higher. But in the meantime, yeah, it's for census purposes and also to keep an eye on bears that have a higher likelihood of coming into conflict. That doesn't mean those bears will. And when I say conflict, guys, I don't mean attacking people. 
I don't mean you know, mauling people. Um, we have 24 million visitors to Yellowstone National Park every year. Um, in this country on average, we have two people per year that are severely mauled or killed by bears. So incredibly rare, one in 24 million basically. Um, about as rare as shark attacks, by the way, two shark attacks on average every year too. Um, these are very unusual events. That's not what they're concerned about. They're concerned about them getting into bird feeders, getting into garbage, learning uh, to get food from humans or being fed by humans. If that starts to happen, then they wanna give the bear the best chance they can. They're gonna go ahead and move that bear to another location further away from people. And then that bear's got a higher chance of survival. So basically it's to keep an eye on the bears, but it's also to keep an eye on the humans doing dumb things around the bears as well. So hopefully that answers your question. Don says, for folks coming in the fall, when did the elk return to the refuge? A real treat to observe. It looks like Taylor in the comment section already gave you a really good answer, which is to say, you know, somewhere in November, but sometimes earlier. When I was a little girl, they actually used to arrive earlier and earlier at the refuge because uh, it was a safe place uh, for them to be. Nowadays, it's far, far better for the elk herd if they return a little later and only make it to their winter range when the deep snows of Grand Teton National Park are going to force them south and force them uh, to be where there's less snow. So the area around Jackson Hole, Jack the town of Jackson, and the Greater Yellowstone Elk, sorry, the area around the town of Jackson and the elk refuge has the least amount of snow for about 150 miles in every direction. That's why elk travel there and have been traveling there for hundreds, um, if not maybe even a thousand or more years. Uh, so great question, appreciate that one. Toya says, do mountain cicadas shed their exoskeleton like Eastern? They absolutely do. And if you look carefully in the trees, you can see cicada, cicada sheds. One of my favorite things to find out there. So keep your eyes open. We're not gonna get the same massive overwhelming hatch like they are with the Eastern cicadas, but still something to look for and really a fun thing to find out there in the woods. They're so big, it's so cool. Ooh, lots of good, correct answers for our trivia question. Rosemary says, what's the lifespan of black bears versus grizzly bears? Rosemary, that's a really good question. We certainly know how long bears live in captivity. How long they live in the wild is something we don't know quite as much about. But in short, it's pretty similar. For a bear to make it into their mid-20s, like Grizzly Bear 399 has done, is an old, old bear. There certainly have been bears in captivity that have lived to be 30 or longer, whether they're black bears, grizzly bears, polar bears, or Malaysian sun bears. They all have about the same lifespan. Alrighty. I think, let's see, oh, maybe one more. everybody's questions this week guys I appreciate the really fun questions that was really fun if you've got more questions you can continue to answer them or continue to ask them in the comment section throughout the week we'll continue to get you guys answers remember to like and share this video if you think it's interesting and you think other people might enjoy it we'd love to expand the reach so we can keep doing these videos for sure it's been such a pleasure spending Wednesday evening with you I hope you all have a wild week Bye-bye.